welcome to Los Cien's intersection of environmental justice and equity program. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And now we would like to do our land acknowledgement and we ask you out of respect to please rise. Today, Los Cien Sonoma County is humbled to bring us together on the lands of the Southern Pomo and Coast Miwok people. We celebrate the active work of their descendants to preserve and to nourish their indigenous culture and identity. We acknowledge the Southern Pomo and Coast Miwok people as the traditional stewards and custodians of this region. We honor with gratitude the land itself, all of its ancestors, past, present, and future. Los Cien respects the enduring relationship that exists between today's Southern Pomo and Coast Miwok people and their traditional territories. Once again, thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Arcel Perez. My pronouns are he, him, él, and I am a program committee member with Los Cien Sonoma County. Today's program could not have been made possible without our dynamic design team of volunteers who we would like to quickly recognize. Fernando Carrillo, Neil Ramis, Gil Seymour, Zeke Ortiz, Carrie Fugit, and Julio Gutierrez. Thank you so much for all of your hard work. And now we want to welcome our students. At this point, if you are a student, we ask that you please stand and let's give them a nice warm welcome. Now we want to welcome our community engagers and parent orgs. If you are a parent or part of a community organization that is part of our access ticket program, please stand so we can welcome you. We would also like to recognize our elected officials and elected representatives. We have a ton in the room today, and due to time, we ask that you please stand, and let's also give them a nice round of applause. <laughs> due to the feedback that we received from the last couple programs, we want to point to our looping slideshow to make sure that you know who our premier partners are and as well as our sustaining members, because without their investments and trust, we would not be able to do what we do. So thank you so much. And we also want to give a special shout out to our sponsors for today's program, presenting sponsor, Sonoma Land Trust, and Friends of Los Cien sponsor, Sonoma Water. One last reminder. One last reminder, all of our programs and informative events are being recorded by the Nexo Media team. This is exciting because it will allow us to share this with our 3,000 followers and members, so everyone has an opportunity to listen to the conversations. Shout out to Hector Velasquez and the Nexo Media team. Now, I would like to welcome Carrie Fugit, who will introduce our topic and give context to the conversations that we will be having today. Thank you. It is an honor to be a part of introducing Los Cien's first ever event on environmental justice with our cell and our design team. Los Cien has chosen to unpack this important is issue because the health of our environment is the foundation of the health of everything else, our families, our culture, our wildlife, and our future. 
Malcolm X says it best when he shares that land is the basis of all independence. Land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. However, we know that not everyone has equal access to healthy land, air, or water. In California, the top 10% most polluted and toxic lands have populations that are 91% people of color. We know this is not by accident, that this is by design, that this is a result of intentional decisions to build fossil fuel industries in red line neighborhoods and split communities in half with highly polluted highways. And we know that not everyone has the ability to meaningfully participate in decisions to address this. In a recent report of 116 environmental and land trust nonprofit boards in California, more than half of these boards have no Latino members. This is also a legacy we face right here in Sonoma County. Today's conversation is about shifting the dialogue when it comes to what does it mean to protect the environment. When we talk about protecting the environment, we can't just talk about Taylor Mountain covered in beautiful wildflowers. We have to talk about Ta Taylor Mountain Elementary School, less than two miles away, which is 84% Latinx and in the top three most pollution burdened percentiles of the state. And we have to talk about Cesar Chavez Language Academy, which is 86% Latinx and is severely impacted by heat islands due to climate change, a direct result of inequitable urban development around tree canopies. These environments have a direct impact on education and health. And when we talk about protecting the environment, we can't just talk about protecting beautiful vistas overlooking vineyards. We have to also make sure our farm workers working in those vineyards are protected from heat waves and wildfires as climate change intensifies. And when we advocate for environmental protection, we have to include instigating and leading change within our systems and structures so that communities of color are front and center in the decision-making process about how we address these issues. This means that when our county is updating our groundwater rules and our air quality standards for agricultural workers, that communities of color are centered in this conversation. Today is about recentering recentering as a community on the root causes of our environmental justice issues. Because environmental solutions that don't address racism, white supremacy, and extractive capitalism become band-aids at best and will likely end up causing more harm to communities already bearing the pollution burden for the lifestyles we all enjoy so much. It is within this context that I'm honored to introduce our incredible speakers today. We are so grateful to be joined by Professor Danea Martinez of Africana Studies at San Francisco State University, Merritt College, and College of Marin with Dr. Omar Ricks, who will lay the foundation of what environmental justice is, help us hold a global view of this topic, and share important historical context within which this work lies. We are grateful to be joined via video um, from, by presenter Jose Gonzalez, artist and founder of Latino Outdoors, who will talk about ways his work has advanced environmental justice by increasing access to the outdoors in Sonoma County and beyond. We will then hear from federal EPA environmental justice coordinator CJ Mishima about increasing resources available to fund this incredibly important work. And we are so grateful and honored to close this conversation as well as open this conversation with a powerful dose of inspiration as we hear from Ruben Crowfeather of Standing Rock Lakota, and who will remind us of the power we hold to create change through stories from Standing Rock, one of the largest indigenous and youth-led environmental justice movements of our time. We realize we are going to cover some difficult topics today. So we invite you to invite curiosity if you feel tense in your body and remember our breath as a tool to ground and stay present. After our speakers present, we will have Q&A and invite you to submit Q&A through the QR codes, QR codes on your table or by writing them on three by five cards and lifting them up for our volunteers to gather. We also invite you to join us for an extra hour of networking after the program from one to two in the cafe to unpack the important conversation and topics of the day. 
But before we begin, we are incredibly honored to be led in prayer by Reuben Crowfeather of the Standing Rock Lakota to help us land in this space together in this important conversation. Thank you so much for being here today. How popular. How me talk here, P. Chante was staying up a choose up below. Ruben Kanhi, we are called a march up below. Ian was laha, he mataha. Hunk papa, he matcha. Wana Santa Rosa, Elwati. Ampe to kile, lila yomaki, piwahilo. My relatives, I greet you with a heartfelt handshake. My name is Ruben Crowfeather. I come from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. I make my home here in uh, Santa Rosa with my family. I'm very humbled and very honored to be here today. I want to thank um, Jose first for that beautiful land acknowledgement and also make my own acknowledgement to our Pomo and Miwok relatives whose land we are residing on here, the original stewards of this land who for thousands of years lived in harmony with Unchimaka, Grandmother Earth, with the water, with the plants, with the animals. Today, I bring a little bit of our Lakota philosophy, where we come from. And our philosophy is centered around Mita Kuye Oyasin. Mita Kuye Oyasin is the acknowledgement that we are all related through one creator, whether our skin is is dark or light or our hair is curly or straight or we speak Spanish, English, Russian, whatever the languages we speak, we're all related through one creator. We have so many divides that divide us up in our, our communities, political groups, all these different barriers to becoming unified as one human race. And so today, um, it's my honor to, 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 um, to bring us together to put our minds together in a, in a prayer. In our Lakota language, we say, we to be of one mind. Our Lakota word for the mind is tawaching. And tawaching, the literal translation is, is that what I want? The power of the mind to create, to manifest, is beyond our imagine. Oyate trecha wachinyampi. Our future generation depends upon us. So the things that we do here today and the things that we're going on tomorrow, we, we, we want to do those with that, with that spiritual connection with our, with our future in mind. As we talk about environmental justice, what does it mean? I, I called home to one of my brothers, one of the chiefs at Standing Rock, and he told me, he said, there is no environmental justice. And that was a very powerful statement in itself. So at this time, I, por favor, um, de pies, when not in I ask you to please rise. The power of the mind to create, to create life, to protect all the things that we want to create and to protect, we think about those things. When we came into this world, we have a mama, we have a papa. Maybe we're blessed with siblings. Maybe one day we're blessed with children. Mita kuye oyasin, all of our relations depend upon it. When we think of mita kuye oyasin, it's, it's more than just hunumpa, the two-legged. Wama khanshka oyate is all that walks on this earth. Kia oyate, all that flies. Nue oyate ki, all that swims in the water. We believe mini wichoni ki, the sacred water of life, has its own spirit. We believe wo onia wakanki, the sacred air that we breathe, has a spirit. Unchi maka, the mother earth that we live upon and provides us everything that we need, is a spirit. Even the fire, petawa kanki, that sacred fire that, that we have in each of our communities. So with that thought in mind, thinking about all of our relations, we're thinking about mother earth, thinking about protecting the water, protecting the air, protecting the land, protecting our future. Um, I asked you to, to pray along in your own minds. And maybe you could close your eyes and really pray hard, you know, like... Pray real hard like that. The song that I'm going to sing, Tonk Ashila, 
Washak Maya yo, his grandfather, give me strength. Grandfather, give me strength. On this day, give me strength. Because we need that spiritual strength, Wo Washaka, to continue to go forward. So many of our relatives, they don't have that spiritual strength and they fall to the wayside. We think about all our relatives homeless on the streets dealing with mental illness. We think about all of our relatives who are incarcerated, institutions, fighting addictions, the drugs, alcohol, depression, all those things. We become the spiritual warriors, each and every one of you. It's not just Reuben Crowfeather. It's each and every one of you is just as important and powerful. And your prayer, your thought, your heart is just as important. So at this time, I'm going to sing this song. And I want you to, to envision that beautiful future. Envision that beautiful future for your children, for your grandchildren. We are taught to think seven generations ahead. So your grandchildren's grandchildren. And through the prayer of, of your grandmothers and your grandfathers, that's how you are here today. You know, so we think about our relatives that went on before us and the ones that are coming behind us. <clears throat> Tonka Shela Washak Maya Yo Hai Tonka Shela Hampe Toki Lei Washak Maya Yo Hai Tonka Shela Washak Maya Yo Hai Tonka Shela Ampe Toki Lei Washak Maya Yo Hai Can you say Mita? Kuye. Oya. Sing. A lot of people learn our ways and they, they, they say it really fast. They make it all one word. They, they rush it. But you learned how to, to say it really nice today. Mita. Kuye. Oya. Sing. Mita, mine. Kuye. My relatives, when we say Oyasin, that's when we collect we, all life, all life. And that's very important. The most powerful prayer for our people is when we just say Mita Kuye Oyasin. So I thank you all for um, your kind attention, for your thoughts, for your prayers, and for all the work that you do. I want to say Wopila, muchos gracias to Lo Cien for having me here today. Oh, hecha to alo. Thank you so much for that prayer. I am honored to introduce our first speakers for this program. Uh, please join me in a warm round of welcome to Professor Danea Martinez, Africana Studies of San Francisco State University, Merritt College and College of Marin, joined by Dr. Omar Ricks, who will be giving us a foundational understanding of environmental justice and environmental racism at all scales. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I realize we're here to talk about some not so easy stuff, but we first wanna you know, acknowledge the land that we're on, as well as the people who came together to work really hard to make this happen, as well as our um, contacts, Celeste Winders and Carrie Fugit. So thank you for having us. Thank you. <laughs> 
Also, uh, we wanted to say that uh, we are, uh, we're scholars of race, racism. Uh, that's part of how we come at this uh, environmental justice, environmental racism issue. Uh, we, you know, we of course are trying to analyze the problem. We, the, uh, you know, so the stuff we talk about is not gonna be pleasant because we're doing a diagnosis of what the problem is. If you do not diagnose the problem correctly, you will never address it, you will never solve it. And so part of how we refer to race and racism is in, in, our, in our way as kind of uh, scholars of race, uh, we uh, refer to it in, in ways that may be unfamiliar to people uh, who are used to thinking in certain ways. We, we do not, uh, we, we will mention uh, we will mention indigenous uh, or, or First Nations. Uh, we will mention black, uh, the, the uh, descendants of enslaved peoples in, in the Americas. Uh, but we do not necessarily uh, talk about uh, Latinx uh, as, as its own race because we feel that the way that many people think of Latinx as a race in itself tends to erase indigenous Latinx people, tends to erase black Latinx people, and so we want to make sure people know we are talking about you if you identify as Latinx. We, we are just uh, disaggregating it into certain categories that are related to the, the project of colonialism and, and, uh, and the genocide and enslavement. So we just wanted to acknowledge that. Right? So we're here to talk today about environmental racism, right, and get into um, the politics, ecocide, and the racist structure. There. Okay. <laughs> so what do you think of when you hear the term environmental racism? We're, we're going to kind of do this uh, by sort of you can go uh, th thumbs up if you think of it as environmental racism, thumbs down if you don't think of it as environmental racism, or kind of a sort of, you know, Malcolm X thinking posture, right? <laughs> if you're not sure, right? So environmental racism often looks like black, indigenous, and brown people uh, protesting conditions that are already polluting and poisoning our communities, our homes, and our bodies. Uh, in other words, most of the time when we talk about environmental racism, we're talking about racially discriminatory acts that uh, pertain to the environment, that, that use the environment, right? We're usually talking about Sorry, let me make sure everybody can sort of see it. I'll stand back a little. Now I'm in somebody else's way. All right. <laughs> uh, well, just kind of uh, listen and please go along for the ride. Uh, um, right? <laughs> we're, we're usually talking about an environmental way of being racist, right? But what about, what about this? And I don't know if there's any 49ers fans in here. I know people say, you know, the saying is you don't make Jesus jokes in Jerusalem, right? But I, I don't, I don't want to, uh, <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody, right? But you know there is uh, there is some some truth to why it is named 18 why it is named after 1849 right that we need to think about the San Francisco 49ers are named in celebration of in celebration of uh, groups of white settler colonizers many of whom committed horrific acts horrific acts right genocide ecocide enslavement of indigenous people right um, and uh, it, it, all during the California Gold Rush of 18. 49, right? Is this environmental racism? What's your thoughts? Thumbs up, thumbs down, or hmm? Okay. And what about this? First Nations, Aboriginal, and other indigenous peoples have, fought, have long fought to maintain their traditional practices for forest management and preventing massive wild, wildfires. But settler societies in the US, Australia, and elsewhere outlawed them for a long time. Is this environmental racism? And what about this? Uh, risks of flooding are higher, and deadly urban, e uh, urban heat islands are more common in black, brown, and indigenous areas. In other words, flooding and deadly urban heat islands are racialized. Is this an example of environmental racism? And what about this? Take a look over here. You can see um, these, these are drone shots. Um, this is a drone shot in South Africa. Black people live in the 
uh, area that you don't see green space, and those same black people can't even go into that other area today, for the most part, in that green space. Same thing with Brazil. What we call the luxury effect. Access to green space is highly racialized in the US and across the globe, and lack of access to green space routinely undermines the physical and mental health of brown, indigenous, and black communities. Is this environmental racism? Absolutely, good. And what about this? During a desperate water shortage, which they're actually having right now, as hundreds of mostly black and colored South Africans wait in long lines to use a few shared water taps. When I say a few shared water taps, I'm talking about 10 for 300,000 people. Many white South Africans get private wells drilled in their own backyards to get priority access to water for luxuries like backyard swimming pools and flower gardens. Is this an example of environmental racism? And what about this? Uh, this famous painting uh, artist John Gast painted it called American Progress in 1872. It makes Manifest Destiny look bloodless. Notice the, uh, can you click it one more time? Uh, notice the, there we go, arrow pointing. An angelic looking <laughs> white woman and the settlers and wagons and railroad, railroads traveling with her across pristine wilderness. And, then press it again. I did. Okay, thank you. Also notice uh, the indigenous people fleeing into obscurity, into literal darkness, right? As of just voluntarily, right? Uh, is this an example of environmental racism? No. And what about this? Sheep may seem unlikely instruments of genocide, but together with the cattle that trampled edible plants and fouled the water holes, they were the innocent embodiment of historical pressures which wrought massive and irredeemable destruction, irremediable, sorry. The tide of strange animals loosed on the Aborigines, carefully tended grazing lands, displaced the Aborigines game and the Aborigines themselves. And this is by Tony Barta, we get this from Tony Barta, Relations of Genocide, Land and Lives in the Colonization of Australia. Is this environmental racism. And what about this? A lot of prisons and jails in the United States are built in areas with a high risk for flooding and for extreme heat, as well as wildfires, which we know about here in California, right? And inmates are often not evacuated during emergencies, right? Given who's most likely to face incarceration, is this an example of environmental racism? And this, if modern slavery were a country, it would be disproportionately black and brown. It would have the population of Canada, and it would be the third largest emitter of CO2 after China and the USA. And the people it served would di be disproportionately non-white. Is this environmental racism? Don't give out on me now. You got to put right. up your... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this, this is a quote from uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel by the geographer Neil, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Jared Diamond. Uh, Neil Diamond, I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> All right. Uh, but the African way of life was designed to avoid mosquito-borne infection. Africans made their homes, traditionally, right, in high, dry areas when they could, away from the natural habitat of the mosquito and they often grouped them into smaller groupings of people, right? So there wasn't as big of a target for mosquitoes. Unfortunately, with the arrival of, the arrival of colonizing Europeans wreaked terrible damage on these centuries-old mechanisms of survival. Torn from their villages, forced to live and work together in massive numbers, right? And in unsanitary conditions, tropical Africans fell ill as never before. I know this is something we usually think of malaria as just something that kind of goes with the territory in Africa. No, it is an introduction of colonization. The scourge of malaria throughout Africa today, uh, Diamond says, is in part the consequence of the destruction of a way of life which had existed for thousands of years. And I'm not even going to ask y'all, but <laughs> you know, you know that's environmental racism right there. Right? 
And this, rich white countries live unsustainably, while poor black and brown countries have the smallest carbon footprints of all nations. People in wealthier, whiter nations emit 50 times more gas house gas per person than those in poor black and brown nations. As the consumption of white communities increases, the fine particle pollution called PM 2.5 increases in black and brown communities. Is this environmental racism? So as you can see here, we're trying to, we're looking at the traditional way of looking at environmental racism, but we wanna expand it. It's much bigger than how we have traditionally thought about it. It comes not just from uh, dumping pollution next to black people or next to indigenous people. It came with the colonial project itself. But first, before we go into that, I wanna just talk a little bit about what racism is so, do we, so that we don't get it twisted. First of all, race is an invented way of ranking people. It is not just you know, categories. It's an invented way of ranking, ranking people with some on top and some on bottom based on similarities and differences in certain aspects of their appearance. Racism is a power structure and socially constructs, creates and reinforces racial categories that we now recognize, like black, white, Asian, Indian, um, categories that have very real consequences. So race is made up, but racism is very real. Race is a power structure created and maintained by both extreme violence and hegemony or hegemony. Race would not exist without the racism that maintains it. But it also needs oppressor and oppressed to kind of play along, makes it a little easier if people can buy in to their own um, oppression. So first it happens through extreme force and naked violence used by civilians, police. This force is always at work, even when it's temporarily suspended. And then there's hegemony. The, the stories designed to make us consent to racism by normalizing it and making it seem ridiculous to question the racial order. These stories are carried by word of mouth, schools, religion, media, entertainment, social media, sports, arts, all kinds of stuff. Remember, racism happens on many different scales. And we wanna do a little bit of a demonstration so that you really understand this one because it's commonly misconstrued, okay? First, it happens on the individual level. Take a look here. This is a yellow little um, clay. The, the individual level is the thoughts you have about yourself and those most like you, often called internalized racism. Now, this is the most common one that people think is racism, is interpersonal, and it's probably one of the least worst, even though it's really bad. Um, interpersonal, when someone discriminates against you because you are black or non-white. And you can see here, we've got a different color. Institutional, this is the one that most people talk about. When a school organization, business, or government engages in policies or practices that impact you because you're black, indigenous, and brown. Now, the, other, the thing is, is that a lot of people use the word structural to talk about it as if it's in institutional. No, structural is something totally different. It makes up all three of those mixed together. And when you mix it together, like he's doing, right? It makes something new, something new and more dangerous. And as it keeps mixing over generations and generations, it's really hard to pull it out and just target one, just target institutional and see if you, you know, and, and make things change. You have to target the entire structure. Institutional racism often takes the, po the form of businesses, organizations, as educational institutions or government agencies working to uphold the racist structure through seemingly race neutral laws, policies, or practices. 
Most often, race is not explicitly named in environmental policy and practice. To understand environmental racism, we must also understand structural racism. Again, structural racism is when a global racist power structure is reinforced through state and non-state institutions, called institutional racism, interactions between people, interpersonal racism, and the thoughts and feelings of individuals, internalized racism. And it, again, it makes something new. Remember, racism shapes the bad as well as the good. Don't forget it shapes the good, okay? Because it shapes who the good is good for. It is, it is environmental racism when black and indigenous people live disproportionately in places with environmental hazards. hazards. It is environmental racism that the main places black and indigenous people can find to live are in areas with natural and built environmental hazard, hazards. But it is also environmental racism that white people benefit from disproportion, white people disproportionately live in places with clean air and water. White people as a whole benefit from environmental racism. When a society grows from a genocide Environmental rate destruction can be held up as an ideal. In societies built on slavery and settler colonial genocide, ecocide, the destruction of ecosystems, is normalized as the American way of life. The right to destroy the biosphere is sanctified in law and cultural practice. Yes, people can actually become psychically and culturally invested in destructive ecocidal practices even after they understand them to be destructive, especially when they think the only people harmed will be people they view as subhuman or non-human. And right here, a good example of that is driving. So now we, we kind of got an idea of what racism is, but now let's learn a little bit about what is environmental racism. So thinking about en environmental racism uh, in the same ways that we think about racism, right? thinking about racism structurally, we need to uh, go over like the standard definition, which is environmental racism is the social injustice represented by a disproportionately large number of health and environmental risks cast upon people of color in the communities in which they live. Uh, these minorities are the most common victims of things like toxic landfills, waste incinerators, industrial dumping, uranium mining, and other environmentally detrimental activities. You can click to the next, uh, next slide. Thanks. Uh, as a practice, uh, whether purposeful or unintentional, whether purposeful or unintended, right? Environmental racism is often reinforced by government, legal, economic, political, and military institutions, right? Because it occurs simultaneously with other racial inequities, high poverty rate, deteriorating housing, uh, and, and, uh, and infrastructure, economic disinvestment, inadequate schools, uh, acute unemployment, and poor or inaccessible medical services. This is from a 1995 report called Environmental uh, Social Justice for All. Right? Oops. Uh-oh. Uh, but if racism is a structure, is environmental racism a structure too? Yes, yes. We definitely need to understand how the human relationship to the environment, you know, the human, human need for things like what are called ecosystem services, different uh, uses that people have for uh, the, what the environment is and provides uh, to us for, for living, right? Uh, all of that it can, uh, can be disrupted by uh, an environment, by a racist structure, right? The important thing to remember is this, race ranks lives. Race is a ranking of life, right? It is invented and maintained as a technology. Race is a technology, right? A social technology specifically to do that, to rank the life of people, right? Uh, so we can uh, click through to the next slide, I think. So a concept that I want to make sure you understand is uh, what's called necropolitics. Necropolitics is a concept developed by this man, Cam Cameroonian political theorist, Ashil Mbembe, uh, he developed the concept to describe the ways that, that power structures 
uh, produce death, right, as, as part of their regular functioning, right, that they need certain people, certain people to die. That's their first consideration. Um, and some of us may have seen that if we're, if we're like uh, essential workers, for example, and during the COVID pandemic, there were all these uh, politicians in the news talking about, well, you know, we need to go back to work so we can save the economy for my grandchildren, right? Um, never mind that that said politician never actually himself or themselves, right? They, they, they don't, they don't, they won't, you know, they're not concerned about their own health. They, they're taken care of, right? But people who don't have health care, they're, they're not concerned about, right? You can uh, click through. Um, you can click through again, uh, just to rush it along. Yeah, that's one of said politicians, and uh, you can click through from that one. And there's another of said politicians, and he didn't like so much that he said that after he said it, but he did say something about, you know, hey, two to three percent mortality among school children is not such a bad thing. Well, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see what he what he thinks about having said that. But look, um, I, I want to uh, try to rush through this a little bit. Um, Necropolitics isn't just actions that happen during the uh, pandemic or during, uh, during you know, these, these sort of discrete emergency situations. It, we, it's important to remember it is built into the way the society is structured. It is a fundamental part uh, that the first consideration that was made in developing America or in developing South Africa or developing, uh, you know, uh, Australia, other settler colonies, the first consideration is not who should live, who should we protect. It is who should die, who has to be killed, who do we have to get out of the way to even have this land, right, where then we can propound about how all men are created equal. Who do we have to enslave, to kidnap and de-indigenize from their own land so that we can enslave them to develop this land? You know, who do we have to do that to so that we can have this land to say all men are created equal, right? That's the first consideration of a necropolitical order. Um, you can click through. Thanks. Uh, and this is something with which uh, many, many people are familiar, uh, uh, some quotes among the black tradition for sure. Audre Lorde uh, talking about litany for survival and how we were never meant to survive, how this is a kind of social order is created, that we are defying that and resisting that social order, we are resisting that power structure simply by surviving, right? And so we have to speak out about it, right? You can click through. Um, thanks, uh, uh, let's see, you can click through again, <laughs> thanks. Uh, let's click through again, I think. And uh, yeah, and any approach to environmental racism has to acknowledge the ways that a society that's founded on genocide and slavery is inherently, inherently ecologically unjust. And so we're going to have to resist that structure in order to uh, bring about environmental justice. Let me. Uh, No, it's the, okay. it's the other one, yeah. I'll do this. Okay. So one of the things is we got to be real careful, even in the envir environmental justice movement, because we can do more racism even in those movements. Happens often. And here's a great example of that. Conservation, many times, is about what settlers want. John Muir wanted to establish Yosemite National Park because he wanted bourgeois white people to have a place to come restore themselves away from the cities. A few Miwok people were allowed to stay in the park, their ancestral homeland, serving as guides for white visitors. But establishing Yosemite forced the Miwok people off the land they had lived on for thousands of years. Muir had a disdain for the Miwok people, calling them hideous. This happens all over the world, including in South Africa. Starting during apartheid, there was a push by South African white people towards conservation. This protected the plants and the animals at the expense of the Africans. Black people kept kept out of conservation sites or were given inferior facilities. Black people were also displaced to create white-only spaces for conservation. They protected plants and animals, but not black children and people. This is not justice and did not stop the problem. South Africa has actually been on the, the forefront for movements and rethinking the way we think about environmental justice, um, something called critical environmental justice. Genocide of indigenous and black people and destruction of their ecosystems went hand in hand. 
This requires a new concept called ecocide. Ecocide is the destruction of ecosystems, whether intentionally or not. Because people rely on their ecosystems for survival, genocide, the death of a group of people, often goes hand in hand with ecocide. Okay. Um, should we just, yeah. So here are four key takeaways. You want to do what you want me to do? Takeaway number one, we need to expand our understanding of what environmental racism is. It's not just pollution dumped near people of color. It's baked into the colonial project, which we still live with every day today. Takeaway two, racism is a power structure that structures our world into a privileged group that lives well at the expense of the non-white world. One benefits because it takes from the other. There is a relationship. It's not just happening that some people get things and some people don't. It's one gets it on the backs of the other. Do you want to do rest? Real quick. Um, takeaway number three, uh, colonialism has always used environment as a technology of racism to structure the world into who gets the good, green, luscious, healthy, fertile environment and who gets the barren, dangerous environment that causes premature death. That is structured into colonialism, right? And takeaway number four, racism against black and indigenous people is inextricably linked to ecocide. If you want to destroy a people, and we didn't get to go over the sides there, but the, the, the US Army, for example, destroyed uh, many herds of uh, bison uh, in order to subjugate the indigenous people who were resisting in the, in the plains. And they also, uh, George Washington, of course, drained the swamp, before it was a campaign slogan, uh, drained the swamps in Virginia and North Carolina, partly because he wanted to help expand the land of plant that was available for plantation agriculture, and also partly because enslaved and indigenous people would hide out in the swamps. That was where we would escape to, right? So, last word? Okay. So just for a last word, understanding structure helps us to struggle for justice. It's survival pending revolution. The Black Panther Party had this saying, and what they used to say is, we have to do survival. That's why they had all those programs, you know, breakfast programs, all that kind of stuff to help the people to survive. But they always kept in mind that ultimately the, the goal is revolution. Yes, we need to act locally, but if we don't work on ways to battle structures like racial capitalism, we will literally be running to put out fires and never destroying the problem. Because this is a global structure that creates this, we have to create a new structure so that we aren't constantly chasing fires. Thank you for having us. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you so much, Danae and Dr. Ricks. We would like to remind you all that there are QR codes on your tables. If you have any questions for any of the presenters, please submit them there, or you could also write them on the index cards. Uh, for our next presenter, he was not able to show up today due to a last minute invitation to the White House. So Jose Gonzalez will not be able to be here, but he has sent us a video and we will link that to the following email regarding the program today. So you guys could check it out. Hola, buenos dias. My name is Jose Gonzalez, and I'm going to take a, a little bit and share a little bit what I kind of consider environmental justice orientations. Uh, this should complement, of course, and add to uh, to what is being shared by the other presenters. So, so please know that uh, in that way. And we're limited by time, so there's always all kinds of other things we can go on. So to start, I want to kind of acknowledge uh, <clears throat> that we'll be approaching kind of like what what is environmental justice. Um, and part of this role here is to both look at the larger context of how we're tackling systemic, historical, uh, and structural oppression, uh, while also knowing that it can spread across disciplines. It's interdisciplinary. It has a history. It has an academic practice. It has like real work on the ground, um, and all of those kind of play a role in it. 
And to start, I often think about an example like April 22nd, 1970. So this date is coming up. And you look at these two pictures, uh, and on the right, you see planet Earth, and on the left, you see some kids planting a tree. And you could think of both of these as like, here are some Earth Day events. Um, and yet the Earth picture is symbolic of Earth Day. And at the same time uh, that the first Earth Day was launched in April 22nd, 1970, we have the founding of Chicano Park. And so that picture is actually of Chicano Park. It's not an Earth Day event. And yet they're happening at the same time. And to me, it's kind of indicative about how we've both been part of the work, but maybe not always seen as part of the movement. Um, and part of that is because we're both for the people and the planet and the way that our comunidades really value open spaces, but not just for the sake of having green space, be because it's also a social cultural uh, place. Another one you often think is when we think about uh, the book Silent Spring, for example, and Rachel Carson as both the writer and the scientist, if you're familiar with this narrative, with this story, it's an important kind of American environmental movement inflection point. Uh, there was a clear call to action to be able to say, hey, we got to stop um, DDT because it's impacting an, in, uh, the ecological landscape. Basically, it's killing the birds. It's thinning their eggshells. And we have to do something about it. And so the narrative that kind of came out of this was, <clears throat> this is even 25 years after in 1997, um, and what's only kind of even recently really changing is that here we go, um, you know, the founders of Environmental Defense Fund brought about this original DDT lawsuit in Suffolk County, New York, where they showed the ospreys were having poor reproductive success and eggs that had not hatched contained high concentrations of DDT. The lawsuit ultimately led to the nationwide ban on DDT on June 14, 1972. And so that's kind of the environmental story. And yet what's kind of often left out is the fact that EDF wasn't the only organization um, kind of suing to ban DDT at the same time you had the uh, California Rural Legal Assistance, CRLA, uh, uh, suing on behalf of migrant farm workers in California. And this is important because at that time, and even now, but especially at that time, you know, nature didn't have standing in court. People had standing in court. And so the fact that you could prove impact on people uh, really made, was able to advance the case uh, that also benefited in terms of what uh, EDF was was uh, stating as the impact on, on nature, on the birds. And so this is important because at that time we said it's a marriage of convenience uh, rather than really strategically redefining the issue about like, hey, DDT harms people and uh, our non-human kin, birds. And so we missed that. And so we often say, well, what's up with that? Because many of us know that farm workers kind of routinely and systematically have been excluded from a lot of the protections, uh, whether it's labor, whether it's environmental, whether it's housing, like you name it. And CRLA actually had handed off the case to EDF, which then took it, and that really contributed to the success. Um, and part of what we often acknowledge is that, you know, we often say that uh, right here, it says pestis has, while an important issue in their own right, became a metaphor for the larger power struggle that such a subaltern group as farm workers had the audacity to challenge agribusiness methods. So that's when we get into that element of power. Uh, these are some of the uh, source books if you're interested in reading more. And so I share that because when we lock, look at environmental justice, of course, it's addressing environmental injustice and looking at both the field, the research and the movement that promotes uh, environmental and social economic justice. So there is that uh, person, a people component by recognizing that direct link between the, the economics of it, the environmental health issues, uh, and ultimately what is reparative action? Like, what do we do about it? How do we fix this? There are several definitions and a, a common one, of course, is the EPA, kind of like the fair treatment. Um, and this matters, of course, how we support uh, policy definitions, because that is those are the processes by which we allocate resources. So it is important to really look at, at how these definitions and not just work in the movement, not just work in academics, um, but how they show up uh, as policy. For this, um, I'm kind of acknowledging as we're looking at this work, at least at least kind of three components. One is really recognizing uh, disproportional impact on Black, Indigenous, and, and people of color communities. Uh, two is 
that we know that these communities tend to care more about environmental uh, policy solutions. So we're already willing and interested, but there's different elements of structural power that doesn't always allow us to manifest that. And that this leadership has been present in the environmental conservation movement. And it's often buried, oppressed, under highlighted, forgotten, just as those migrant farm workers and their role, they're part of the story in the DET ban that benefited the birds. Um, and for me, I kind of, my entry point to a lot of this work is kind of in the outdoor uh, nature sustainability, but that's all part of, of, of this, for me, the same picture. It's about our relationship to land. And what does that mean to be in this relationship to land that isn't just extractive, that isn't just what we call, what I call a utilitarian reductionism, uh, is just the land is only there to be used. Um, and then a couple of other framings around that is the reality of doing this work is grounded in the reality of their kind of demographic inevitability, or as we say, take California, which is now plurality Latino. That means it's the largest kind of uh, demographic uh, group. And by 2050, the United States is going to be kind of this plurality of quote unquote minorities. And so the demographics of 2050 are very different than 1950. So that means it affects not just the people that are here and who's affected and who's represented, but also who is represented in these positions of power, in this decision-making spaces. So as an elected official, um, as someone that makes the policy, as someone that heads a foundation, as individuals that are now there in these places of power that weren't there before, and so that comes both with the opportunity and responsibility to say, you know, as the Latino community, as we know, we are part of the environmental solution, just as much as we are part of the environmental impact, just as much as we have our own uh, role in environmental history. And I often kind of say this example about unpacking a little bit of some of this work, because if we just presume that people don't care or they're not connected to it, we can kind of continue and perpetuate these inequities. And so take, for example, here, uh, this question about, hey, what's your interest in the following activities? What's your interest in hiking? And if you just ask hiking, people might kind of uh, respond to that in this way. And a takeaway could be like, well, look, here at 19%, um, the Black identified demographic, they don't care as hiking about as much. But yet, if you ask the question, what about walking outdoors? They all shoot up. And so what's the difference between hiking and walking outdoors? Uh, physically, we're asking your body to kind of um, be in the same practice. And so it allows us to think about some of these social constructs, the terms that we use for which people connect or disconnect. And so environmental justice plays a huge role in letting people know you're part of this work, too. It isn't only about the, you know, protecting uh scenic uh, wildscapes. It isn't only about caring about the birds, is we want you to acknowledge how you as humans were part um, of environmental work. And I used before this term about kind of utilitarian reductionism because uh, I share this as some of the language that's present in our, in our movement work and to think about how environmental um, justice and environmental injustice work comes out of all of these isms, these ideologies of oppression, like racism, uh, sexism, uh, and so forth. And they're interwoven kind of in the system of harms. This is off of the work of Dr. Rupa Maria. Um, and we'll use a term like colonization to kind of describe how it's driven so much of what we've inherited in, in all of these ways that harm us. And yet, if we flip that to a life honoring worldview, so instead of looking at colonization with this reduction of mechanistic logic that says, I'm going to treat the land, I'm going to treat uh, the trees, I'm going to treat other people as things, as objects, as things that I can, um, you know, justify being harmful to them. To think about life honoring worldview, which many of our communities have had, uh, all our indigenous uh, native communities. Um, have had this relationship of saying, it isn't just a natural resource, it's a natural relative. And so if those trees are, you know, your primos también, what does that mean about caring for them with that responsibility? You can still use them. You can still cut them down to make the houses. Uh, y todo eso, pero what, how can we be responsible to not only reduce them in that way? Because that shows up in how we reduce people as well. And then lastly, 
um, kind of these ideas that this shows up kind of on lines on the map that have consequences. And redlining is a classic example of this because even though it started in housing, it shows up very much in everything else. And then the Bay Area, it's no exception because this isn't just um, about intentions and like people choices. This is the structural elements that we often talk about, that we've inherited all of this. And it wasn't just by people saying, well, I choose to live here versus over there. There's other elements at play in terms of uh, individual bias, uh, discriminatory practices, whether you get the loan or not, how the funding is allocated, um, and even what's get, get what gets written in the loan documents about who could own that home and not. And this is just in the 1950s, 1960s, 70s. So this is within a generation. Um, and so in the Bay Area, and even a place like Marin, <clears throat> just south of Sonoma, you know, you have this clear separation of amazing uh, scenery and nature. And yet it is one of like the highly segregated counties in terms of where people live. Um, and so these are some of those aspects of environmental justice that um, isn't only clean air, clean water, and so forth. It is those, and I often say it is kind of access to all of the benefits of nature and how we um, we have that relationship to land. And so why, why this is important is because it redlining wasn't just about housing. It shows up in so many other things, such as our, our health outcomes, our access to green space, uh, how hot our neighborhoods are. And if we don't change to these maps that we get to inherit them, inherit them, and then they keep showing up in, uh, in all these different ways. This is, for example, at the top, you have the redlining maps, and at the bottom, you have emergency department visits, um, and you can just kind of see that direct correlation. And then uh, this impacts redlining, like I said, it impacts all these different ways, it, but in relation to our, our outdoor and nature and access work, it affects just the nature that's around you. And so when we talk about the ecological and evolutionary consequences of systemic racism in urban environments, it's really saying, how do these redlining maps affect even the nature that shows up in your neighborhood? And so these maps now are an important base of research because they're there. It is the structural element. Like I said, it wasn't just people choosing to live in one area or another. There were push factors, policy push factors, um, you know, economic push factors that were telling, uh, mandating really people as to where they could live. And this can affect, right, the um, the nature, the ecology of that landscape. And so that is an environmental justice issue as well. And then I had mentioned um, that a lot of our data and research shows that communities of colors consistently care about better environmental policies, actions, outcomes. And so it's our invitation to really step into that decision-making role and challenge what prevents us from being in those decision-making roles, because this is our community are kind of saying, we're, we're in, so vamos, what are we doing? And the final piece, which I know some of other presenters are sharing, is um, that environmental justice kind of as this economic, um, pardon, this historical reality has many di different territories while acknowledging, of course, the importance of leadership by particular communities and especially Black leadership um, in terms of their you know, centering as the civil rights movement provided a, a strong source of spirit, a spirit experience and leadership to environmental justice. Um, at the same time, you had other tributaries that included the labor movement, uh, native sovereignty uh, movement, and the anti-toxic movements, some elements of, ac of academia. So just know that we have these, and let's recognize some of this leadership, uh, one of the main ones being Warren County in North Carolina, kind of this 1982 pro protest, this is Black communities um, led by local church officials were out there on the streets and saying, you're not going to put this toxic uh, site in our neighborhoods. I had mentioned the DDT and the farm workers were often kind of written out of the story. And yet um, this is the story that I was sharing earlier about uh, we've been part of that, but but we haven't always been included or seen as part of the leadership. And then in 1990, the letter to the Big Ten, where all of these grassroots environmental justice communities kind of wrote a letter to the big environmental organizations and say like, hey, what you're kind of promoting is nice and all, but it's so quote unquote, nature focus without the people. And as the people are part of nature and we have these realities of, of negative impacts on our communities, we want to be a part of this too. 
are you in or are you out? Um, and they didn't get a good response. And so t- 10 years after that, we got to kind of keep it working and it slowly changed it and has been changing. You have organizations like the Sierra Club, for example, have finally embraced it. Um, but this isn't new. This is part kind of our, of our history and work. And so, <clears throat> para cerrar, you know, I just think of it as kind of this uh, multifaceted jewel when it comes to environmental justice, uh, reparative action, justice is like how do we restore the whole if injustices takes away if it causes a harm what does reparation look like um, and we can look to some of the leadership within our communities uh, and some of our colegas uh, to do some of the solidarity work um, so native land cons- conservancies um, asian pacific environmental network indigenous environmental network uh, both from far away and close right down in our own communities as well and so, gracias. Uh, this is the way that I often close my work through art también because it plays a role. So, you know, here is a piece of mine that kind of illustrates both our current relationship with land through outdoor labor. And I want to expand from outdoor labor to outdoor leisure and outdoor love, um, even as we're impacted with pesticides, for example, all of these elements that our farm worker communities may, may um, be affected by. And there's additional readings here that if you're welcome to follow up, this is only one piece. There are so many, many, many more. And of course, what our other uh, colegas and presenters will be sharing. Gracias so much. I apologize that I couldn't be there with you all today. I actually have a um, uh, an, uh, a White House environmental justice event visit uh, that came last minute. And uh, I look forward to staying connected. Muchas gracias.